our calling in the faith circles is so married to doing. It is so yeah. married to career and what we do. What I learned in that space of falling on my knees and realizing that I had completely got it all wrong. That's when God really revealed to me that we have these two callings on our life. We have a faith calling, which is unmovable, unshakable, unrootable. That is our purpose on this earth. That's the only reason I'm here. Vocational calling is seasonal. You can branch out. It's going to change. But remembering that your vocational calling is just the vehicle. It is the conduit by which you're going to love God and love people. It's the conduit to fulfill your purpose. Hey, I'm Jody, And I'm Chris. And we are Loving, Loving the, the Outcome. Outcome. Welcome to our podcast. We're a husband and wife who rock out together. We're parents of Milo and Ziggy. And we're following Jesus as best we can. Our story began in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where we fell in love, got married, and decided to sell everything and travel in our Jetta, selling CDs out of the trunk of our car. The road led us to Nashville, where we signed a record deal, started our family, and now the four of us travel together in our minibus, White Neptune. I know, crazy, right? Our life is a road trip. And we want to invite you into it. So come along for the ride as we chat with some of our favorite people about family, spirituality, wellness, and of course, music. Come on, let's go. Well, hello there. <laughs> Hi, babe. <laughs> So what am I getting you in the middle of? Uh, I'm just uh, just jamming a lid. <laughs> well, I guess in honor of um, quarantine, this is quarantine life. All of our podcasts are Zoom. So we thought we'd Zoom each other for a second as an intro to this video. I'm in... The podcast corner um working on my own stuff and you're in the music room working on your stuff <laughs> yeah i mean I, i'm sure when i edit this you can probably hear the echo of each of our computers in the background but it's really yeah. fun We're we trying have a, a probably eight minute window while the boys are across the, the yard playing with our neighbor yeah we now fit everything into 12 to 3 that's our window of productivity that's it <laughs> Thank you, Harold. So how's your how's your day going? Because we're kind of trading off with the kids, so I'm always like, "How are you? How was your time with the kids? How was your morning, babe?" Uh, it was good. You let me sleep in today, so that was nice. And uh, 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 so Milo's been watching Wally -E a lot lately, the Pixar movie. So he's very into organizing. So we went into the trailer afterwards, and he helped me organize all your CDs and nice. uh, and all of our bracelets. Ooh, perfect. And, Put him to work. And uh, our neighbor, Caroline, came over and her mom, Katie, was like, uh, what is Milo doing? Because he, he was taking pieces of wood and like putting them in his shirt and rolling them up. But he was acting like Wally, putting stuff into his trash compactor belly. <laughs> it looks odd if you don't know what he's doing. Yeah. So, yeah it's like, oh, <laughs> Yeah, well, life is a little bit odd right now, so that's that's okay. Milo's just embodying what we all feel, um, but I feel like we're doing pretty good. I feel like this week was a fairly good flow. I mean, we yeah, had we, moments. We should probably make clear to everyone that I'm not quarantining from you in another room. That's not why we're doing the Zoom. No, uh, we're doing this because we were both working, and then Chris is like, I'm editing the podcast, so we need an intro. Let's do our intros on Zoom, so we're just like, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, how you felt like overall the week was okay. I feel like we did okay this week. Um, I think it was good doing, I had some little adventures with the kids so that I wasn't multitasking work and kids at the same time. Yeah, you found a great, uh, you found a great pond area, like along yeah. the week. Yeah, it was good. It's, um, the longer that this goes on, the more you settle into a routine and, and also at the same time, the more weird it becomes all at the same time like right. talking to paula ferris on the podcast this week was like very personal i felt because her book that's coming out actually it's out now uh, by the time you guys listen to this podcast it's all about how she left her two dream jobs she was a 
an anchor on The View and she was um, an anchor on ABC Weekends. So like really high, high quality, incredible career topping jobs and felt completely like it was the wrong path. Like her family life was rough. Her and her husband were not on a good, good page. So she left it all because she realized to her that career was what calling meant. She didn't know who she was without her job. And I feel like that's exactly what we're facing and what a lot of people are facing. You know, you and I are on the road right now. Um, so we're doing other things like, but we're really realizing who we are apart and our identity, what it is apart from our career. So this one hit me, hit me pretty hard. There was a lot of personal takeaways for me on this podcast. Yeah. I, I enjoyed the fact that she had, uh, you, you'll see on the video that she has a sign saying, welcome to the chaos. And, but her room is like totally nice and neat and like a nice white background. And then behind you is like complete chaos. Like <laughs> basically what's behind me because you recorded it in this room. Music room slash playroom. Yeah. yeah, I know. It, there's no hiding our season right now. And that's okay because I think that's what everybody gets to be their real selves. Even if you don't want to be, you're sort of being forced in this season to look at your life and look what's on the inside because that's what's coming out in our reactions to each other and da da da. So it's a really revealing time. And I feel like her book is perfectly timed. I don't know if she meant, I'm sure she didn't know it was going to come out during quarantine, but I feel like a lot of people are probably struggling with like, what's my identity? What's my worth apart from my job or people that are on the front lines that are working like such stressful, hard hours and are probably having a lot of anxiety also kind of going, where does my peace come from? You know, is my identity in Christ? Cause if it is, then maybe I can be on the front lines without losing my mind, you know? So I think this is going to be a timely book. So for anybody who doesn't know who Paula Ferris is, go follow her at Paula Ferris, one R uh, in her last name on Instagram and on Facebook. She said she's mostly on Instagram and she has a lot of wisdom to share and her book is out everywhere you find books and, um, just go pick it up. I think it'll give you a lot of life in this quarantine season. And thanks for making it all come together, babe. You're so good at making it sound good and look good and produce all the episodes. I'm just realizing, uh, you look amazing in this zoom. I think, I mean, first of all, you, you do look amazing in general, but I think your computer has a better camera than mine because this, ah. I mean, I just perpetually look like I've gotten out of bed. Which <laughs> is not totally untrue. You have fluffy but, hair and I'm not mad about it. You, you have a nice, a, light, a nice light in front of you. So yeah, maybe that's the way to do it from now on. You set me up, babe. You set me up to win. That's what you do in life. You set me up to win. With my book, you set me up to win. You just are always looking out for me. Well, yeah, now I get to brag for a second because you're, I mean, your book is doing awesome. It's not even out yet. And you've, <laughs> your Kickstarter is just like literally kicking butt. <laughs> it is completely blowing my mind. I'm not going to lie. I mean, you know me. What have I said all this time? Like, I'm not an author. I can't write a book, da, da, da. And, but you and Holy Spirit didn't let me off the hook. And I finally did it. And you're right. People are just supporting it like bonkers crazy. It's incredible yeah. yeah because you don't have to spell to be an author an author right you can spell check for me we're a team <laughs> i think there's 19 days left on the campaign at this point babe so if you still wanted to get your exclusive you got this t-shirt it's not too late oh i wasn't i'm not wearing it today i should have been <laughs> but yeah for real anyone who's listening that still wants to pre-order a book it's not too late there's 19 days left on the campaign and uh, there's some exclusive packages, like you can get in on the launch party in Nashville. And there's one place left, as far as I know, to um, get the like VIP everything package. And uh, so head to Kickstarter and check it out. And thanks for pre-ordering, guys. You're amazing. Babe, is it you pre-ordering all the books? No, I promise that it's not. <laughs> okay. I have not maxed out our credit card doing that. Because I could see you just for the sake of supporting me doing something like that. Um, and hey, how about Worship Wednesdays? That's been a total riot. Yeah, it's really fun. What's your favorite song that we've been playing so far? Oh, I was just I'm literally going to ask you that. Um, so 
Worship Wednesdays, 7 p.m. And that's like the only gig we have to talk about right now, guys. That's it. That's our gig. 7 p.m. Worship Wednesdays across all socials like YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, blah, blah, blah. Oh, man. My favorite song to play on this last week's was probably imperfect because I finally got the guts to just sit at the piano and play it by myself and Ziggy hopped into my lap while I was playing it and it just always almost makes me cry so that was my most favorite moment what was your favorite song off the new album that we played off the new album I always love playing same page oh yeah that's the, a fun the more the more we it's one of those that like the more we play it the more I like it yeah well, um, the new album was timely. I feel like, well, it's half the album, to be fair. It's an EP. We're releasing the second half in the fall. But for those of you that need some new quarantine tunes, just get, um, get You Got This, the EP. There are six new songs on it. Tell us what you like and what you don't like. Just keep it to yourself. And um, I think we're choosing us. the rest of the songs this afternoon, right? Say that again? Well, we're going through a, a playlist of all the songs that we've recorded Oh, yeah, we are. Six months. I know. We're trying to finish off this album and we have all these songs. It's crunch time. Time to like pick the top faves. It's exciting. We're, we're making the most of this quarantine. <laughs> well, without further ado, um, I think you guys are going to love this conversation. Babe, I know you were behind the scenes. You didn't get to be part of it with me, but you gave me the two thumbs up. So I, I have faith that this is a great episode. So there's 30 more if you guys haven't heard them. Basically any topic you wanna to learn more about or dive more into, I think we cover a lot of ground over the last 30 podcast episodes. So pick somewhere and start and let us know your feedback. And like always, um, the more that you subscribe and rate and review the podcast, the more people hear it and it gets shared across to all your friends. So if you're enjoying it, give it a thumbs up and um, leave us a little, hey, you guys are great. <laughs> okay, let's dive into the episode. I love that you're like, like if I just look at like one half of your picture, I can see kids' toys, and the other half it looks like a recording studio. So <laughs> that is right on point. That is right on point. I know. Yes. Usually, so we made this little corner of our house. We don't have a big house, but we turned like our breakfast nook into like it could serve as a podcast nook. So good. But during this season, we have nap time, like from basically now for two hours to just make it all happen. So I'm in like the quietest corner of the house, which is, yeah. Toy. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm, I Can I just say, Jody, I miss nap time. We don't have nap time anymore because my kids are too old. They're yeah. 12, 10 and six. But nap time was like Jesus time too. Yeah. And it's just, it's just never ending. Oh, I know. Never ending. Yeah. Oh, I guess every awesome. stage has pros and cons and everything. But yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Can you hear it, that in the background? Was that a blender or a child? That was a child. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's right on. That is right on. Right. There you go. There you go. Hey, you know what? Let's, okay. just, let's just do it. Let's just dig in. Okay. And yeah. Great. I'm sure I'm going to have plenty of interruptions. So a dog barking, a child barging in something there's going to be some sort of like five alarm fire that's that's going to interrupt it but it's all good well i'm so stoked to have you on the screen in front of me and just be able to chat with you this is a huge honor thanks for taking time oh thank you it's an honor for me i really appreciate it so first of all this is release day for your book am i right yes it is april Congratulations. 21st thank you it's it's one of those days you know i birthed three physical babies Birthing yep. this has been different, um, and and some of the other authors that I've spoken to, I'm like, why do you do this to yourself? It's, it's so emotionally exhausting, and putting your heart on paper. And there's so many emotions that go into this: terror, excitement, um, tears, nerves, nausea, 
I mean, all of the above, you're feeling it. And it's such a long process, the literary process. I turned the book's manuscript in almost a year ago. And so um, it's just it, the gestational cycle for in the literary space. This is so much longer than what we're used to. But mm-hmm. listen, I'm I'm really grateful. I never thought I'd write a book. Um, the joke is I'm an open book. I just never thought I'd write one. And I didn't want, and I certainly didn't want to write a book just to write a book. Yeah. I, and I had publishers approaching me, um, Jody, over the last couple of years. And I said, I, I'm not going to write something because I don't have anything to say. And I truly feel like God gave me something to say within the last couple of years. And that's what this book is. Wow. Okay. So called out, man, what a title like that made me want to read it right away. And there's so much to talk about in this book, but the subtitle. So I traded two dream jobs for a true calling. Can we like start right there? Because to me, I look at your life, right? From the outside, external, right? And I'm just like, oh my word. Like this woman is a go-getter, powerhouse, knows what she wants. You heard my Canadian right there, powerhouse. And uh, I'm from, I'm from Michigan. So I appreciate a good little oot go out or a little nasal accent. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. You'll hear it. You'll hear my Michigander accent come out every now and then. (laughs) I love it. I love it. I'm in Nashville. So I'm trying y'all, but it's not natural for me. It's like, (laughs) like, this is so weird. But anyway, yeah. So ABC anchor, I like view co-host all this, like these lists go on and on of all of your achievements and accolades. So my brain went two places, right? It was like, first of all, way to go on like being a woman who had the courage to show up and go out and go after what you wanted to do. I, I really find that part really inspiring. Even more inspiring though, is to leave it behind and step away because Mm -hmm. once you've reached those success dreams, yeah, like it, I don't know, achievement's a big deal and you worked so hard, I'm sure. And then I feel like stepping away. So I, there's these two sections of your story because you're a new friend to me that I really want to dig into because I'm an achiever, right? You're talking oh. to a girl who left mm-hmm. Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, lived in her Jetta, sold CDs out of the trunk of her car, all with this dream and this voice that I really was sure was the Lord calling me to share my music and nobody else was asking me to do it, but I felt like I was supposed to. Yeah. So the intersection for me personally coming into this podcast with you, is like very personal for me because Mm. I can relate to a lot of your book and your highs and lows and struggles with it all. Because when my passion became my paycheck, things get interesting. It changes a lot. And So I've had highs and lows within it all. And I just wanted to start at the beginning and go, why did you, why did you trade in, you know, two dream jobs um, to go after your true calling? Let's start there. Well, I feel like God called me out of a space where I was addicted to that achievement and the accolade and the spotlight and the accomplishment. And it became more about doing instead of like, I forgot what I was doing and who I was doing it for. Mm. And I think, you know, in society, there are books about leaning in and we're supposed to press in. And Jody, that's almost always related to career, is it not? So, yeah. so then we invest ourselves into, and we invest our value in vocation, our worth is work and our calling is career. We press in and we lean in so hard to those things. Mm. Uh, I was at a professional high, but a personal low. So this professional high, you know, anchoring Good Morning America weekends, um, co-hosting The View, but my personal life was just crumbling around me. And I thought, God, you didn't call me to this moment to, to, to just spectacularly, um, you know, implode. Like if, mm-hmm. if you called me to this, why is everybody getting my leftovers? If you called me to this, why is my health suffering? If you called me to this, why are my relationships with you, you know, with God, with my husband, with my kids suffering? And why are my professional and personal choices clashing with my professed values? So I really felt God was calling me out of the season and I had to be obedient. I knew he was trying to get my attention. I still loved what I did. Like some people burn out and they hate what they do. I loved what I did, but I was addicted to it. So I literally had to be extracted from the situation. 
And so even though I felt that stirring in my spirit and I could, I saw what was going on around me, the landscape, the relationships, the health, it wasn't until I write about it in the book, the season of hell that I endured. And um, it, it's, it was like five events that happened in a short period of time. It was within seven months. And I knew unequivocally God was trying to get my attention through that. It started with a miscarriage and an emergency surgery that ensued. And then this freak accident before I was getting ready to go live for Good Morning America on Wall Street, someone threw an object at my head 60 miles an hour and I suffered a concussion. And then the day I get cleared to go back to work after the concussion, like the day I get cleared, I get in a head-on car crash and then I get influenza, which turns into pneumonia. So like God was trying to slow me down even though I refused to. And I think like some of us um, have the wherewithal and the courage and the intuition to read signs from God and to sense the, that, that, that stirring in our spirit and to see the relationships around us and to know that everybody's getting their leftovers and to take action then. I didn't. I had to go through this personal crisis. And it was mm -hmm. after the crisis, um, I, I said, okay, God, you got my attention. I'm going to do this, even though it's really scary. Um, and I was paralyzed by my fear too, like fear of what people were going to think. Um, was I a failure that I couldn't hack it? Yeah. Um, but I knew that I had to be obedient. Mm -hmm. And um, so once I stepped away from those two dream jobs into this space of ambiguity, yeah. um, it was in that space where, like, where I write much of the book because I felt like I fell flat on my face, Jody, because I, I stepped away and I realized I had no idea who I was outside of that, mm -hmm. that my identity and my purpose and my calling had been in doing it had been in my career it had been in work it had been in vocation and things that shift and things that change wow. and um that's where i write a lot a lot of the book is in trying to like discover like how do how do you root yourself so firmly um into your purpose how do you root yourself so firmly so that when personal crisis or pandemic comes you are unmovable and unshakable and so that's really what the book's about. Wow. I feel like this is such a timely book. I, I'm sure you've wrestled with the lie that it's not because it's a pandemic. I don't know if you felt like that. It's crazy. Oh, I have because most of the book tour has been canceled. So I was like, okay, great God, you know, you, right. but I, I, if he's God and because he's God, he can do what he wants with the message in a pandemic or not. Yeah. So Amen, sister. And I think mm -hmm. that at a season where people, not everybody is in a pause season, but there's no doubt that things are shifting and changing and renewing uh, on the outside. And that's a chance for us to let God shift and rearrange and change things on the inside of us. Mm -hmm. And I feel like so, that's so good. Gift. That's the gift within it all. If we can be courageous enough to know that there's always a gift when we're mm -hmm. with the Father and we're following Him, and I feel like this book is going to be a gateway to that for a lot of people that have maybe been stripped of what they achieve. Like I'm looking yes. at the window at my trailer, full of merch and albums that we ordered and played one show on our tour, and we're on visas in the U.S. This is we're here to do music and music alone. So it even gets a little trickier when that's tied to my my doing is literally tied to how I live here. Yeah. And you know, God is way above and beyond all of those things. And it's not why I started doing it. But once you yeah, you get in a season like this, it's so tempting to go down that trail of thought, like the real flesh mindset of like, I see my trailer. What if I never play a show again? What if, what if, what if? I feel like yeah, you, yeah. it's going to be a chance to sort of reroute our thinking into like kingdom mm -hmm. mindset, you know, like there's always a gift and God is outside of time and he can redeem and use everything. And your book is going to be- That's so right. Beautiful. Amen. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for saying that. And I do truly feel that we've Yes, we're all experiencing loss on a visceral level, some more than others. Yeah. Some are losing their homes, some are losing their jobs, some are losing their wealth, some are losing loved ones to this crisis. They're mm -hmm. losing a sense of significance. And the book is really about, it's not just straight memoir, um, because I'm a reporter. I right. interview other people who have misplaced their significance and yeah. their purpose mm -hmm. and how we have discovered to find, you know, discovered that unrootable purpose. But I do think in a moment like this, like God had to use for, for me, and I don't want this to be about me, but he used a personal crisis yeah. to get my attention. And I do think God does allow 
things to happen. I think God is giving us a giant reset button right now in this global crisis. We can reset it. We can reassess. It's a chance to really reflect on where our identity comes from if we have misplaced our significance. And I will be the first to admit, I was so proud and haughty and I would declare, you know, even at the height of my career that I wasn't defined by what I did. I was defined by who I was and that I could walk away at any moment and I'd still know who I was. But then when God truly said, oh, you would and called me out of that, I realized that I had a big plate of crow to eat. I had to swallow my pride and realize that those things that I declared so proudly, um, they weren't matching up with, with the reality. Wow. And so, again, I, I think this is an opportunity for us to reassess and to reset. It really is. I agree. Yeah, to let God rearrange things on the inside because that's the part he's concerned with. <laughs> mm-hmm. But we can be so externally focused. And the world is, I mean, that's how the world kind of works. But I feel like, I don't know if you can relate to this because I, I really feel like you can. I feel like some of your quotes in the book Um, are similar, but it's like, it's up from the overflow, like everything Mm -hmm. that we share, everything we say, it's just from this overflow and whatever's internal is going to dictate what comes out, you know? And so I want to, I want to unpack the word calling for a second, because I feel like you share at the beginning of the book that that was a word that was thrown around a lot, you know, whether it was a sermon or whatever it was, it's just calling, calling, calling. And you're like, what on earth? Like, what is this mm-hmm. word actually, you know? Yeah, and especially yeah. if it was completely calling equals career is sort of how you had seen it, which I've spent a lot of time there too. But for everybody listening, can you just unpack calling and the difference between maybe like vocational calling and a faith calling and how you see that? Sure. Sure. I think, you know, when I, I, I feel like since we were little, people were like, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do? One of the first mm-hmm. questions you ask somebody in society What's your name and what do you do? Yeah. And so our calling, and especially yeah, not just from society, our calling in the faith circles is so married to doing. It is so yeah. married to career and what we do and instead of who we're doing it for. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think I had good intentions when I first got into broadcasting. Clear eyes, full heart, can't lose. You know, I was stepping into this calling, right? But along the way, it became more about what I was doing and the, ac- oh yeah, I'm doing it for Jesus. The accolades, the accomplishment, the spotlight, it became so much about doing. And I kept pressing into that. And that's why I, where I really struggled when God, I sensed God calling me out of that was um, like, why, but you called me to this, right? God, you called me to do this. Right. If so, why why is my personal life in the gutter? Like, why is my relationship with you suffering? Why is my relationship with with everyone around me suffering? Why is my health suffering? And so I think when I learned, what I learned in that space of falling on my knees and realizing that I had completely got it all wrong, that's when God really revealed to me that we have these two callings on our life, okay? We have a Faith calling, which is unmovable, unshakable, unrootable. That is our purpose on this earth, okay? That is to love God and love people. It's never going to change. And notice it has nothing to do with career. So often we link our purpose on this earth with doing. We link our purpose with career, with job. For me, faith calling won't change. It is my purpose. It is to love God and love people. That's it. That's the only reason I'm here vocational calling is seasonal. You can branch out. It's going to change. But remembering that your vocational calling is just the vehicle. It is the conduit by which you're going to love God and love people. It's the conduit to fulfill your purpose, the conduit to fulfill your faith calling. So, oh, there's a kid. Landon, can you say hi? Uh Uh-huh. My purpose on this earth, and for those that are listening and can't see, um, Landon, can you come here? I want to show Jody your your mullet. Mm. My purpose is on this earth is not to be um, a hairdresser. Um, for those that are listening, I gave my husband started it and I kind of finished it. Can you um, come here? No, no, no. We got to we got to see it. Turn around, turn around all the way. You see this beautiful mullet that I gave him? Rockstar. Mm-hmm. He looks awesome though. 
Okay, Such buddy. a rock star. See, my kids She's have cute. a family mirror and their mullets are like, it is so real. Ziggy's bangs are longer than mine. Like neither of us can see. It's out of Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're from Canada and I'm from Michigan. I think you and I can appreciate a good mullet. A little business on the top and party you're on the bottom. 100%. So, so anyway, that's where I feel like God really revealed to me that we need to have this honest conversation and stop throwing this word around mm -hmm. so and so casually um and it's a confusing word you know there's it's full of ambiguity like i i was never really able to to articulate what calling was outside of career and so now that i'm able to say i have a faith calling and i have a vocational calling and i can separate the two and i know what each is and i know what to expect from each um, and I know where my value is and my worth isn't in work. This is just, God has given us each unique talents and gifts yeah. and, um, and our vehicle to show the love of God to people is through vocation, whatever season you're in, whatever branch you're on. So and we can pivot. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. We can pivot. I think once you accept that your worth isn't your work. Um, God can give you the permission to do so many different things. And I think we back ourselves into a corner. Um, I don't know if you felt like this. I felt like as a broadcaster, I don't know what I'd do if I wasn't a broadcaster. You may have said, I don't know what I'd do if I wasn't a musician. But really peeling back some of those layers, what makes me a good broadcaster? What makes you a good musician? Mm -hmm. What makes me a good broadcaster is that I'm innately curious. I'm dogged. I mean, I always love to get to the bottom of stories and I champion the voiceless guess what? That can translate to so many different capacities, not just in broadcasting. So seeing yourself multidimensionally, as opposed to, you know, just one dimensionally, giving ourselves the permission to branch out, knowing that our worth is at work. God can use us in so many different capacities. As women, giving ourselves the permission to off-ramp and not buying that lie from society that if we off-ramp, and want to be home with the children for a while that that is not a vocational calling that that's right. not not valuable um, and that we won't be able to get back in one day that's such a lie um at, at, you know giving ourselves the permission that vocation can be seasonal like god can call us to different things in different seasons but as long as that's not our identity that's that's not where we're placing our purpose and our identity and our significance realizing that what we're doing we're remembering who we're doing it for. It all comes back to, I'm just loving God and loving people in this space mm -hmm. through this. Yeah, that's beautiful. So for people that, cause I'll get a lot of questions or DMs, like I really feel God calling me to this. I feel called to it, but X, Y, Z are just not working out. Things are not aligned. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Um, what would you say to somebody who's trying to find their vocational calling? Sure. Okay. I conduct an interview in the book and this was one of those aha Oprah moments for me because, I, you know, vocational calling, we've used that word calling, but like, how do you really articulate what it looks like, what it sounds like, um, what it feels like. I conduct an interview with a gentleman named David Shedd. I know you've never heard of him. I never heard of him. He was a high level government guy. Okay. used to run the director, he was the director of the intelligence agencies post 9-11. So he oversaw the FBI and CIA. And he had written that he felt called to go into government. So I was conducting this interview with him. And I said, all right, you have said you felt called to go into government. What does that mean? What does it mean? What does it feel like to be called? And he said, vocational calling looks like three things. A, are you good at it? B, do you love it? And C, do trusted people in your life notice that you're good at it and that you love it? It's not enough just to be good at it, Jody. It's not enough just to love it. You have to be good at it. You have to love it. And other trusted people have to notice that you're good at it and you love it. Mm -hmm. I use an example. My very good friend is a, um, a business reporter, but she um, is so wise and intuitive and she is a phenomenal consultant, like a business consultant. She's consulted me on a myriad of levels. Other people have noticed that this is really like her talents lie here. And so I've tried to speak some life into her and say, you should really think about this because she's good at it. And she goes, but I don't love it. Mm. She's not being vocationally called to that area. She doesn't love it. So that piece is missing. Mm. Um, so I That's think it's all three of those things. And I look back at my life, you know, in terms of the, my talents and gifts, people, you know, I, I, you know, was I good at, at, 
you know, at, at broadcasting, but even to peel back those layers, I've always been innately curious. My nickname growing up was Paula 20 questions because I just wouldn't shut up. I, I always want to get to the bottom of things and champion wow. people. Um, so this is like who I am inherently and what I love to do. And my high school teacher, Mr. Barsoon, my drama teacher, was the first one that said, you should really think about this vocation, go into broadcasting. And then my college professors said, you should really think about being on air because this is where we feel some of your talent and gifts lie. I look back at that and I'm like, that makes a lot of sense because this was, the, you know, my proclivities, what I was good at, what I was curious about, my like inherent curiosities and what my trusted people in my life were speaking into. Yeah. And so I, I, I think that that's a real, a really easy way to peel back those layers and see what am I equipped to do? Now, how do you know if God's leading you in a different direction? Maybe God wants you to branch out. I think that, um, you know, that's when you have to go back. And like, for me, I knew God was trying to get my attention to get me to branch out because, because I, re I assessed the landscape and I, I felt this guttural pull. I felt, I didn't have a peace about where I was. My, my values were clashing with my choices. Everyone was getting my leftovers. So I knew, and I felt that spirit, I felt the Holy Spirit moving inside of me that it was time for a change. And that's how I knew that I needed to branch out and that God was trying to shift me into something different. Hmm. I feel like that's really going to be huge for people listening to be able to separate these two parts of calling out. Because then mm -hmm. when we find ourselves confused, that may be the thing that we're passionate about and good at and, and all the three things you listed aren't making us money, aren't becoming our career. We can step back and go, because that's the thing. I think we get stuck sometimes like I'm good at this and we're in a world now where you think it, believe it, do it, go for it, da da da. But we think we all need to make money off of our passion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's, you so know true. it's, it's tricky because that may not be the season. Like if God isn't calling you to that in the season you're in, it's not the right timing. And we just have to That's be so right. in with Holy spirit to know when to move in those directions. Yeah. So I feel like you might I, be that's good. I think like God, Hey honey, can you, can you, can you guys not slam the doors and can you shut that door really gently? Okay. The doors keep slamming. Sorry. Totally. Okay. Um, no, I think like when you sense that, that tug and you sense the spirit moving and you take an honest look and assess your landscape and what's going on. And I, I think for me, like I, I had to listen to God too. It's not like God was like, I want you to go in this direction or, you know, I, I, I had to just step out in faith at the beginning. And I think so many of us were paralyzed by our fear of what we're walking away from and then what we're walking into because it's the unknown. Right. And God didn't really reveal, he, he wasn't like, I need you to step away from this. And then I have this landing spot for you. I had no idea where I was walking into this like season of total ambiguity. And I still kind of feel like that. But um, I think we should expect and anticipate fear anytime we're making a decision, um, big or small, but especially bigger decisions. And not only expect and anticipate it, but um, we need to press into it. Um, I love that verse in Joshua where, where Joshua has been tasked to take down the city of Jericho. It's in Joshua 1. And he's asked to circle it, circle the city seven times. I don't know why. I mean, sometimes we feel like we're circling, but I think God tries to refine us and to see if we're obedient. So he asked, he asked Joshua to, to circle the city seven times, but then he says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid and don't be discouraged for the Lord your God's with you everywhere you go. We are commanded to press into that fear. We are commanded to push into it. Wow. We have to take that first step. It's like yeah. Martin Luther King says, faith is taking that first step when you can't see the rest of the staircase. Okay. Mm -hmm. We are commanded to do it. God acknowledges the fear. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. He acknowledges that it's going to be there, that it's going to be present, but he promises that he's going to be there with us through it at the end of it. Mm -hmm. For the Lord, your God is with you everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. So for those of us that are scared to take that next step, even though we know that we have to take a step, even though we're not really sure what we're stepping into, 
it's called obedience and it's called pressing into the fear and it's called Mm -hmm. obeying God. He's commanded us to do that. He's going to show up when God calls you to do, when God calls you to a new season, God will equip you a hundred percent. He just wants you to take the step. Yeah. He's going to be there. I told, I can attest to that hundred percent, man. It's like Mm -hmm. learning how to almost get, this sounds funny, but almost get comfortable with fear, like almost expect it but just expect and anticipate it's not something that you conquer and that goes away right oh i conquered fear 10 years ago we have to deal with it we have to press through it on a daily basis and if you have to push into it done anything new in 10 years so then that's a little bit scary right like things are hard new things Mm -hmm. are scary new seasons are scary you know, Mm -hmm. and you're right. If you are pressing into those nudges of Holy spirit, those gut feelings, we're out kind of always, whether it's a new conversation, we are scared to have sometimes it's big, but sometimes it's small. Like it's that neighbor or it's that, Oh, I think I need to go talk to that person, but I'm introverted or whatever. You just feel like it's not your area. Right. Mm -hmm. Like this is Mm -hmm. my thing, but man, if God's really wanting to do a work inside you, yeah, it's like, that do but it think sooner. about think about the moments where you have pressed past your fear and how rewarded you were for it or how invigorated um how how confident you felt afterwards yeah. um everything that you worked you know the thing the most valuable things in your life the things that are most rewarding you had to pay a price for them you had to press past that fear and the same yeah. you know the same goes and i think it's a matter of you know, listening for that still small voice, but also knowing like who to listen to and what to listen to. You know, I, I firmly believe that God speaks through scriptures and sermons. He yeah. speaks through songs, like that song that came on the radio. I've heard a thousand times, but God was, I felt like it was for me, God speaking to you. Yeah. He speaks through dreams. He speaks through trusted advisors. If you don't have a group of people in your life that you're doing life with that know the good, bad, and the very ugly about your life that can, that can call you out and hold you accountable um, you need to find a good group that can speak life into you. Yeah. Um, those are other ways that really God really speaks. I mean, I think we all want to, oh, God, God spoke, the clouds parted, and I heard this deep baritone, and God told me exactly right. what to do. But God speaks through the every day. He speaks yeah. through, 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 he speaks every day, and he's speaking in every moment. It's just up to us to know, to decipher and discern yeah. and know where to listen. Which I think is a beautiful thing. Um, sometimes being a bit confused and having to wrestle with things, I think is really good. Like it's uh, really absolutely. hard. It's really mm-hmm. hard, but needing to sit there with the Lord and ask questions. He loves our questions and actually pause long enough to get his perspective. And, you know, because when I'm in my own head and wanting my own perspective, and wanting my own way, I don't have eyes to see or hear yeah, at all yeah. what he's doing. It's, yep. Mm-hmm. So, but just sitting there and sitting, sitting there in the discomfort sometimes. Yeah, you know, totally. And meditating that's, on it. That's huge. And that's really courageous. Um, man, I think we all really need your book. I'm really super pumped. Thank um, you. I don't, and I don't feel like, I really honestly feel like this isn't my message. This is, I, 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 I honestly never in a million years thought I'd write a book, Jody. I'm not a book person. Like I, I like to read books, but never, I've never had a dream to write a book. Mm-hmm. Not, I'm like, people that write books are crazy because it's so, books emotionally exhausted. Everyone yeah. I've spoken to said it is a torturous experience. Right. Never wanted to, but I really feel like God gave me this message and wanted me to write the book. And again, I was like, if you want me to write this book, then you have to put the right people in my life. Yeah. And you know, you like, that's where you can also call God out and say, this is what you want me to do. Yeah then, then I, I, you need to bring the right people into my life. Um, you know, when we're stepping out in faith and God's going to show up, he yeah. totally shows up. So, and I think it's cool. I mean, people will be shocked to hear you say that because you're confident and you're so well-spoken and you've spent your life in, in front of a camera and knowing how to like use your words well. And all these things, it probably seems shocking like to me and everyone listening that you would feel that way. But I think it's really cool too. Like there's such authority in our story and what you've walked through and the interviews you've had and everything's led you here, you know, to this Mm -hmm. moment, to getting to just really steward your story. And you're right. It's not just all about Paula, but it's about what he's done through you and the tests you had to walk through. And now the testimony you have is your book. 
Yeah, which is, yeah, like, and beautiful. And I joke that I joke that the book is not just straight memoir because I'm not that interesting, and I'm truly not. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I conduct a lot of interviews, um, and there's a lot of observations and anecdotes from others who've also misplaced their significance, and then how we've really been able to to root into the unshakable. I think, so. I think that's like misplacing your significance is just going to speak whether or not people have a dream of being like an anchor or, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. moving to New York city or becoming a musician and all these crazy things, or whether it's, I'm a mom at home and I've misplaced my significance. Like mm -hmm. I don't remember who I am. I think that mm -hmm. this is going to speak on all levels, you know, because yeah. figuring out what we're called to our faith calling and our vocational calling, that's, that's universal. Everybody's trying to figure that out. We're just yeah. in different seasons. Right. Mm -hmm. So who are you? outside of these two dream jobs. I mean, you've touched on it, but like, who are no, you? No, I, I think like two, a couple of years ago, before I went through this, I would have said, hey, I'm Jody, my name's Paula Ferris, and I'm an anchor at Good Morning America, and I co-host The View. And that would have been my identity. Right. So now my purpose and my identity is totally rooted outside of career and doing. I say, hi, Jody, my name, you know, I'm, my name is Paula Ferris, and I'm a wife, mom, I love Jesus, and I'm curious, and I'm a question asker, and I champion the voiceless. You know, things that aren't tied to career. This is just inherently who God made me to be. Yeah. And um, that's my purpose. Like that, and this pandemic isn't changing that. It's not changing any of that for me. Um, so I, I feel like, yes, we're all wildly, yes, we are all being affected um, on different levels. Um, I feel because I was able to go through that crisis, I, I know who I am. Yes, I, I am affected in, in, on a myriad of levels through, through the pandemic, but it's not uprooting me. It's not yeah. shaking who I am yeah. anymore. Yep. That's huge. I mean, people have asked us that too. You guys aren't home. You're not touring. You don't have any other jobs. Like, how is this? And it's funny, Chris and I sort of chuckled and we were like, man, we've had some really rough times over the last couple of years. This isn't really, we've kind of gotten to know God as provider. We've had to know him in that way. You know, we've kind of gotten to know God in these ways that until you're desperate, you don't know him as dependable in those ways. Yeah. Sometimes it takes those hard seasons. So it's like getting comfortable with fear, also getting comfortable with the fact that like, yeah, you're right. God is the same as he was before this all hit. And I've gotten to know him intimately in some of those ways. And so I'm, mm -hmm. I don't feel quite as shaken um as i as i maybe would have a couple years ago going i'm not doing what yeah. my identity is i'm not selling my merch i'm not singing my songs i miss those things mm -hmm. i think in a healthy way like i get a lot of joy and a lot of life like yeah said, and there's nothing thought, wrong with that i mean that's normal yeah. of course yeah yeah but i'm not sitting here completely like devastated and who am i but i'm lost was, and lost, but that happened when I lost my voice, which this is not about that story, but I lost my <laughs> and like literally found his in a season of six months of silence because I couldn't sing a note. And so wow. I know what you mean. Like we hit those personal crises and we're just like, wow, okay. There's some stuff. Yeah. I can really look at myself, myself right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, that's so freak that you would, as a singer, you would lose your voice for an extended period of time. And there's no doubt that God does allow a crisis every now and then yeah. individual global for us yeah. to to reassess and yeah. to reflect and to yeah. reset if needed 100%. absolutely well i think this is a book for this time and i'm super stoked that you had the courage to write it and step Thank out you. and like step in in a new way and Thanks, totally gift it. That. yeah to chat with you like what a dream and seriously like i was so stoked for this i even put on like some jewelry so you walk the hair a little bit, you know. It's like your hair looks really great. I was gonna say, you've got the denim and black and a little bit of gold going on. Um, I, I feel like I'm a little bit of a hot mess. And who would have thought that my children would have interrupted this podcast more than yours? You know what? It's like you said though before we started. I still get nap time. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Yeah. That's the only uh -huh. reason. Otherwise, they would have been an hour ago. I wouldn't have been alone. They would have been playing the drums and yeah, the tracks. So yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Before I we love go. It. I want everyone to know where to get the book, where to find you and hang with you. Sure, sure. Um, I The book's available pretty much anywhere. Amazon, you know, walmart.com, target.com, Barnes & Noble. I think Christian bookstores. It's available on Audible too. Oh, awesome. Um, we have an audio version, which I narrated, which was really kind of cool. 
Um, and if you want to get in touch with me, here, so people are gonna uh, enjoy that. my voice is very Midwest and nasally. So, but um, it was, <laughs> you know, it's funny because my, you know, my high school drama teacher is the first one that really was speaking life into this particular vocational area of broadcasting. And he would continually cast me as the narrator of, of all of our productions. And I was like, I want to act, please. And he said, no, you're a good narrator because of your inflection, the, the, the way that you can communicate. And um, it's funny because really that's what telling a, a, a story on TV is. It's narrating a story and yeah. communicating that. Yeah. Um, anyway, I totally just went down a rabbit hole. With I that. love it. But, um, but if you want to reach out to me, you can reach out on Twitter or Instagram. I rarely, if ever, on Facebook. I don't really check my messages there. I don't understand much of social media, so definitely not on TikTok or Snapchat. Cannot figure those two formats out. I'm not young and hip enough. But if you reach out to me on Instagram, I usually respond. And my handle on Twitter and Instagram is the same. It's my first name and my last name, just Paula Ferris with one R and an A. F so like Frank, A-R-I-S like Sam. Perfect. Yeah, F-A-R-I-S. Okay. Just like Paris, but with an F. Ooh, there you like go. I remember that. I know. We don't want to yeah, be exactly. talking right now, and we <laughs> probably doing too much online shopping. That's going to stick. Um, but yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, link, I'll link everything in the show notes for everybody Thank listening. You. Um, before we go, okay, quick lightning round, like two or three questions. Are you game? Of course. Yeah. Yeah, okay. totally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Favorite food? Bacon. Yeah, girl, come over every mm -hmm, morning. Mm -hmm. um, My husband asked, what did, I, what did I need this morning? I said, coffee and bacon. And fine. I'm oh, good. Literally every morning we make bacon. Mm -hmm. That's the best. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, what's your favorite date night with your husband? Ever? Or like, what's, um, your, sorry, what's your dream? Like, this is my favorite date night when we do this. Okay, I'm not a romantic. So for my 40th birthday, I'll give you an example. This isn't lightning. This is like the extended thunderstorm. Sorry, oh. everybody. <laughs> my, I asked my husband to take me to Buffalo Wild Wings so we could watch football. Um, for my birthday the following year, I asked him to take me to a Michigan football game. So I love sports and that makes me a little weird. Um, no, but yeah, that's a perfect date night for me is, you know, beer, wings, casual, good friend, good conversation, sports. Oh my goodness. Your husband loves you so much. Like <laughs> that's his dream night too. That's perfect. I know my husband gets me jewelry and I'm like, mm, no thanks. So, so yeah. I'm <laughs> A sports girl through and through. My dad coached my basketball team. It was music or sports. So girl, mm -hmm. I feel you. Um, okay, like <laughs> last one. And this is kind of loaded, but um, God is teaching me right now. I'm learning right now. Fill in the blank. I'm learning to give myself grace and give my kids grace. I'm also learning how to homeschool my kids and I'm learning how to um, be a hairdresser. And those last, last two are failing spectacularly. Mm -hmm. Such a good answer. Mm -hmm. That's solid. Yeah. yeah. And I'm also learning how to limit my alcohol intake after seven. Oh, girl. So I told my husband, I was like, okay, one drink a night. So, cause it's been tough. We're all on top of one another. So I don't want to keep turning to it for, yeah, you know, I know for comfort. Like so. It's day night, but. I feel like Margarita Mondays is a thing. Is that a thing? Uh, every day. It's Margarita Day. <laughs> right, exactly. Every day is Margarita. Chris and I literally margarita had a conversation last night. Like, <laughs> okay, let's talk about this. <laughs> I love it. I love that. Honestly, it's so good. Well, I think that we would have a lot of fun having margaritas together someday. But yes. I'm super thankful. Maybe that'll happen. Maybe that'll happen when the nation and the country and the globe is not shut down. So yeah. I know. Believing that day is coming. It is. Oh, you're it awesome. Is. Thanks for taking the time. And uh, everyone's going to love this convo. You're the best. Go oh, get after Thank some. you. So Jody. Here. thank you. Thank you you're for blessing me with the conversation. And thanks to everybody for supporting the book and for listening. Um, I'd love to hear your feedback. Absolutely. Thanks, okay. Paula. Thank you, Jody.